Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Sabbe sankhara anicca, sabbe sankhara dukkha, sabbe dhamma anatati. As I promised a couple of weeks ago, that I would give the three talks, one on anicca, one on dukkha, one on anatta. Having given the talks on the first two subjects, today's talk is on anatta. I began with a well-known saying of the Buddha that all conditioned things are impermanent, all conditioned things are suffering. All dhammas, conditioned, unconditioned, are anatta, are not me, not mine, not a self. And that is a nice introduction to this last of the three characteristics of existence. I was just flipping through a Mahayana book the other day and they call it the three Dhamma seals. Whatever way you wish to call it, characteristics or seals of the Dhamma, these are the three basic factors of all existence. And it's uh, in order to penetrate those truths that we practice the Eightfold Path, to equip our mind with power, through the abandoning of the five hindrances and also through experience, the data of the deep states of meditation to actually uncover these truths. In fact, that once you see one of those to its fullness, you will see the other two. As the Buddha said, that what is impermanent, subject to change, that by its very nature is suffering, is dukkha. And that by its very nature means it cannot be me, mine or self. Whatever is suffering will also be of a nature to come and go, to change. and cannot be a self. And whatever is uh, taken to be a self, that will cause suffering. Uh, the anatta, the non-self nature of things, means that this is suffering, this is impermanent. We cannot create that permanent happiness of a self. So each of these three aspects is just three aspects of one thing, of one Dhamma, of one experience. And whichever way you wish to investigate, once the mind has been empowered and given the data of deep meditation, you can look at experience through any of these three lenses and you may have the opportunity to penetrate the Dhamma. One of the, the deepest and most profound is this teaching of anatta. And it's deep and profound because it challenges something very basic to our assumptions of life. When the Buddha talked about avijja being the root cause of all problems, of all rebirth, uh, the root cause of defilements, avijja, uh, he was actually showing in the teaching of the Vipalasas that you can define, explain what Awija is as follows, that by view, thought or perception you take what is Dukkha to be Sukha. You take what is impermanent to be permanent. You take what is Anatta to be Atta, a self. Never in those Vipalasas does he say that you take what is self to be anatta. It's always something which is anatta to be a self. And that is because there was no atta ever postulated in any which way throughout the teachings of the Buddha. And that's why he says, Sabe Dhamma Anatta. However, to actually to get to that teaching, we have to come down to our real life, to our experience, rather than just going through the, the marvellous philosophy 
the great teachings of the Buddha because that's the, the truth of the Aryas, of the Arahats. And we've got to find a way to realize that truth for ourselves. It comes to mind as I uh, teach this discourse on Anatta, uh, an experience which <coughs> I had in my monastic life in Thailand with Tanajan Cha. In the last few years of Ajahn Chah's teaching career, when he was still healthy enough to give profound discourses, I was still in Thailand at that time. And obviously the, a sickness doesn't just appear out of nowhere. There was a gradual deterioration of Ajahn Chah's health. And so the Western monks at Wat Nana Chah decided to build a sauna not so much for themselves, but so they could entice Ajahn Chah once a week to the Western Monastery for a sauna to improve his health. And the plan worked uh, tremendously well. We built the sauna. I helped out in a little way, but it was mostly another monk's design and uh, hard work. And Ajahn Chah would come over once a week for his sauna. At the same time, he would come and give a Dhamma discourse. And then once the discourse was over in the mid-afternoon, he would be taken to the sauna, the monks would help uh, scrub his back or wash his bathing cloth, help him um, uh, put his robes on again, doing the duties to a teacher. And together with all the other monks, I used to uh, be diligent giving a hand. But on this one occasion, when Ajahn Chah gave uh, a talk before going to the sauna, it was quite an inspiring talk. It gave me a lot of happiness inside. And after the talk was finished, many monks went off with Ajahn Chah to help him take his sauna. And I thought for once, and instead of going right away, that I'd sit meditation and use some of the, the happiness and inspiration from his talk to aid my meditation. So I went round the back of the sala of Wat Nana Chat, where no one was, and I sat meditation. I don't know if it was half an hour or an hour, it couldn't have been you know, much more than an hour. It was a very nice meditation, a very deep meditation. And when I came out afterwards, I had a lot of happiness and clarity in my mind. And of course, the first thing which came to my mind after that meditation was to see if I could assist my teacher, Ajahn Chah. So I got up and started walking towards the sauna. And halfway <coughs> between the sala at Wat Nana Chat and the sauna, I met Ajahn Chah coming in the opposite direction with two or three Thai laymen who had come with him. He completed his sauna and was on his way back to Wat Bapong. But when he saw me, he obviously perceived I'd had a very deep meditation and that my mind was clear. And so it's one of those occasions when he tried out of compassion to enlighten me. And so he looked me in the eye, as Ajahn Chah can do, right through you, and said, Brahma Wangso, Tamai, which means, you know, Brahma Wangso, why? And being <coughs> myself, I said, I don't know. Then he laughed. And he said, if anyone ever asks you that question again, the right answer is, my me a lie. There is nothing. And he asked me if I understood. And I said, yes. And he said, no, you don't. And I always remember that, <laughs> the way he said, boh. <laughs> but... It was an experience, obviously, which stayed with me. As he walked off, it was like a, a profound teaching which he just shared with me. And what he was actually saying, which was obviously everyone here would now be able to understand. My me I, there is nothing. Emptiness, anatta. It's a powerful teaching because in our world we always want to have something, to grab onto something, to say there is something, and to say there is nothing tends to create a lot of fear 
inside of our mind. Surely there must be something we can hang on to. And he was teaching in a very profound way, the teaching of non-self. Whether one looks at the body or the Vedana, the perceptions, the sankharas, such as the will, or the consciousness, or the mind. Each one of these, my meterai, there is nothing there. This was the teaching of anatta. However, it's very hard to get to. And I wanted to point out some of the reasons why it is actually hard to accept such a teaching that there isn't nothing. <coughs> the first reason why it's difficult is because we ask the wrong questions. It's well known that if you ask the wrong questions you will get the wrong answers. And so it's important to ask the correct questions first of all. When I looked through the suttas, you could see that sometimes you have the <coughs> In places like the Sabhasava Sutta, you have like the, the thoughts which do not lead to any purpose or to any use. These are thoughts or questions, inquiries, which are wrongly formed. <coughs> and one of those questions is, you know, who am I? That used to be an inquiry which many people follow in the world, who am I? But a little bit of reflection should make it very clear to you that, that question carries an implication that you are something, you just need to find out who you are. It's not a correct question because it implies an answer. It's not open enough. And so in my practice I change the question from who am I to first of all, to what am I? But even that was a wrong question. It assumed I was something. And refining <laughs> the question down, I began to ask what was a good question, a question which would lead me somewhere, which would uncover illusion. And that was the question of what do I take myself to be? What do I assume this thing called I is? And that question was something which dug very deep into my awija, into my delusion. You started to look, what is it that I assume a self to be? Once I started asking that question, it was like peeling an onion you could start to see some of these silly things which was very easy to take as a self. And also at the same time I could perceive that whenever I did take these stupid things to be a self, to be me, to be mine, they would inevitably cause me a lot of suffering and a lot of strife. <coughs> First of all it was very easy to see that even though that I believed in rebirth, I took that as a fact that this body is just something which I take up and I will give up at the time of death. Even so, there was, from time to time in my daily life, occasions when I would take this body to be mine, to be me. By that, <coughs> I mean that if, especially in the world when people compliment you about your beauty, your handsomeness, your uh, physique or whatever. If ever I moved by, was moved by those comments, I was taking this body to be me, a source of pride. But even deeper than that, whenever there was sickness comes up in the body, then that was a good test whether I took this body to be me or to be mine. It's very easy for me to say the body is not self when I was healthy, when you're young, when you're fit. But the test is that when you are in sickness, especially when that sickness is very deep and long-lasting, it can even be life-threatening. Because that's when you really can see at a deeper level 
whether you take this body to be me or mine. If you are worried, even a small amount of worry and fear, that show there is still some clinging left to this thing we call body. Why should you be afraid of death? It's the most ridiculous fear. A person who's going to die, (coughs) who has created lots of good karma, and everyone who's lived in this monastery has created enormous good karma, building monasteries, helping out, serving, giving talks, helping give talks, whatever else, printing books, helping print books, that's huge big karma. So, if you had faith in rebirth and karma, surely there should be no fear at all about dying. You know, this old body, if it's very sick, you get a much better body next time. What's the fear there? The fear is always because of attachment being threatened, of something which you cherish about to be taken away from you. So if ever you find fear of death coming up at any time, that shows you almost with 99% certainty that in that moment you are perceiving or thinking or viewing that this body is me, is mine, is a self. So we need to contemplate this body, especially contemplate the death of this body, to contemplate the contents of this body, to take it apart, as is said in the Satipatthana Sutta. And to see that just whatever parts of this body, it's just flesh and blood and bones, it's just four elements, it's just atoms and molecules and chemicals, that's all it is. Contemplate again and again and again until you're ready to let go of this body at any time, at any moment. If you're ready to die in this moment, not when the talk is finished, not tomorrow, not next week, if you're ready to die now, then you know this body is not being taken as mine. I often contemplate this body as not belonging to me, but belonging to nature. Sometimes when you say it doesn't belong to me, it's not mine, sometimes it's not as powerful as actually giving it an owner. Some of the Christian sects, they give the body to God. It's not my body, God do your work. That's very helpful in the sense it takes away the ownership, the self of the body. And it can give a lot of liberation. Not full liberation, but going a long way. But of course, as Buddhists, you know, we can't say this body belongs to the Buddha or belongs to God or whatever. What you can say though, with reason, which is in accord with experience, that this body belongs to nature. It's not me, it's not mine, it's not a self, it belongs to nature. (coughs) And nature will take it when nature is ready. It has nothing to do with me or my likes and dislikes, my plans, my agendas. So often people die are the most inconvenient times. Just when you're about to finish something, you will die, no matter how much you plan, with much unfinished business. Don't try and finish all your business, because it's unfinishable. Don't finish the business, finish with the business. Be able to die at any time. It's important to keep contemplating like that because even though one thinks one is not attached to the body, even though logically, reasonably, when you examine it with your mind, you can see this body is not me, not mine, not a self. There are times when you take it to be a self. That's what my investigation was uncovering. Not the philosophy, but the experience. But by continuing with what do I take to be me, mine, a self. Kept on on investigating, hammering at that point. 
If you keep following that way, eventually you'll recondition the mind to see this body belongs to nature. The body can look after it, but the nature is the owner. When the nature wants to take it back, it's nothing to do with me. Take it. But deeper than the body is the stuff of the mind. And first of all, the objects of the mind. You know, sometimes that what we think is us becomes some of the qualities, the objects of our mind. Taking ourselves to be clever, intelligent, taking ourselves to be skillful, taking ourselves to be knowledgeable about the Dhamma. I am the Vinya expert. I am the Dhamma expert. I am the expert sower. I am the expert meditator. So easy for us to actually take our achievements to be me, to be mine. If you take achievements to be me and to be mine, to be a self, the result of that is pride, the attachment to praise. <coughs> and you can understand just how much suffering results in that. Because every time you do something wrong, you'll feel that there is a problem there. Very often because of pride when you do something wrong, you may even break your precepts and lie. Just out of taking sort of your abilities to be me, to be mine, to be a self. That's why in the world, when someone makes a mistake, they usually explain as, I wasn't feeling myself today. When they do something right, that's the real me. Understanding this, means that we can look at all of the qualities such as intelligence, such as you know, abilities of being a good teacher, being charming, being charismatic, to look at all those things, that that is not what I take myself to be. When you do that, you're free from a lot of pressure. One of the problems why monks do not like to teach is because of that particular attachment, being afraid to be a fool. <coughs> Every teacher has to acknowledge that from time to time they will say very foolish things. They will stuff up, they will t say a terrible talk. And it's marvellous to be able to have that freedom. Not always to have to live up to some ideal either imposed by yourself or imposed by others. Having that freedom from that, taking these things to be me, to be mine, to be a self, liberates you to just to go and teach without fear. They say that talking in public is one of the most fearsome things you can do. And whatever there's any fear there, again, it's always because of attachments are being challenged. So you ask yourself, fear of what? Fear of losing what? And it's always fear of losing what you call reputation, an illusion of who you think you really are, what you take yourself to be. When you know that all these things, again, they just belong to nature. It's just conditioned. If I give good talks, it's just because I've been giving talks so long, I've just had good practice, that's all. If I give bad talks, it's nothing to do with me either. It's just because the tea wasn't strong enough. Or whatever else it is. So nothing to do with me. And it's, isn't that marvellous? Just to take away the, the sense of self whenever you do. There's no sense of guilt, no sense of fear, no sense of remorse. You don't go back afterwards and say, what I did today was really rotten and horrible. It's nothing to do with you. So you don't take any of this to be a self. It makes you free. Even when you sit down on your cushions to meditate, sometimes you can say, well, giving talks is not important, or sweeping, or 
doing the jobs in the monastery, but the really important thing, I'm a monk, I'm a meditator, my meditation is the most important. If you take yourself to be the great meditator, then you'll always fail in your meditation. Why? It's because you will never have that freedom, the ability to let go. There'll always be that controlling. Whenever there is a self, the Buddha said, there's things which belong to a self. What belongs to a self is what you control, what you manipulate, what you try and cherish. That's where attachment comes from. And so if you think that your attainments belong to you, that you are the great meditator, then you will find that meditation will be hindered by craving and attachments. When you realise that every meditational success just arises because of causes, conditions which come together, then you realise it's nothing to do with you. You might just say, it's your just good fortune to have been with a good teacher, to have had the uh, facilities, to have the time, to have the health, to have just be in the right place at the right time to be able to do these things. So you never think it's something to do with you. It's just conditioning. That's why sometimes I get a bit niggled when people come up and say, oh, Ajahn Brahm is a good meditator just because he was born like that. I bet he came out of his mother's womb with his legs crossed in full lotus. And that's just ridiculous. Any skill in meditation which I have is nothing to do with me, it's just because of causes. And that's why I keep on saying that it's not some ability or inability in you which stops success in meditation. Never think I can or I can't that is just coming from a sense of self. Create the causes, all the causes are there, and then you will be able to get jhanas. You'll be able to get enlightened. It's just creating the causes. And so much of my work, my effort in this monastery is trying to manufacture those causes as convenient as possible. Because I know it's nothing to do with you to do with the causes and conditions. So you don't take meditation success to be because of you. I did it right. If you think that you've done something right, then you'll try that same thing again and you won't get into deep meditation. So causes, look at the causes, the reasons, not what you did, but what the causes are. And when you get to be skilled in creating the causes for meditation, creating the causes for deep meditation, creating the causes for insight, creating the causes for liberation. Then you understand what bhavana, what development really means, without the sense of self. Because it starts to make it quite clear that what the Buddha said is when you have a self, there'll be things belonging to a self. And when you, there's things belonging to a self, there'll be control, there'll be work, there'll be doing. And you start to see that the illusion of a self, taking yourself to be something, creates the doer. This uh, thing which creates craving and attachment, which creates will which controls what one thinks belongs to you. When Ajahn Chah says there's nothing, it means there's nothing to protect, nothing to do, nothing to control. Control freaks create so much suffering in the world, whether they're in head of a family, head of a business, head of a terrorist organisation, head of a country, or head of a body and a mind, the control freak inside of you. 
where does that doer, that control freak, come from? It comes from taking something to be yours, something which you think you should control, that it's your business to control, that it's your right to control. That's why when people take the body to be a self, then they go and take it to the gym, they make it healthy, they take it to the beauty parlour, they take it to the hairdressers, they wash it, they preen it, they make it look nice, because this is important, this is me, self-image. And they think that's very important, what you look like creates your happiness, so people say, how stupid they are, other people tell the truth. The point is that if you take that to be you, you want to control it. And so people get upset when they start to get old and ugly and smelly. They start to get upset when they get sick. They realise they can't control this body. Sometimes, some people I've seen dying try and control their body to the very end. If you really want to see suffering, if you have the privilege to be with someone when they're dying, and have the, or not really your bad fortune, but their bad fortune, to see them struggling for the last breath to try and control everything. That is one of the most saddest things to see in life. You see other people who have more wisdom, who can let go, who don't struggle in death. They realise this body is not mine anymore. They don't care about it anymore. They don't control it. The doer has gone. That doer comes from taking something to be yours in your control. When you take your thoughts, we try and think our way to enlightenment, think our way through wisdom, because we take thought to be ours. It's okay, maybe you can control my body, someone else can control my body, but my thoughts one of the <coughs> scariest things in English literature was the 1984 by uh, Orwell. We had thought police. People trying to control your thoughts. There were thoughts which were bad. And that was really just a very deep intrusion on what people thought was their human rights what was theirs to control and protect. And again, many people in this monastery think that their thoughts belong to them. But I've been controlling your thoughts for a long time now. <laughs> Not through any psychic powers, just through conditioning by getting up here every Wednesday evening and brainwashing you by all these Dhamma talks. Not only on every Wednesday evening, You've got them all on cassette tapes now and on CDs and brainwash you into listening to them during the week. They're really getting brainwashed into Ajahn Brahm's Dhamma. Actually, I've noticed that myself, that some of the thoughts which come up in my mind are very fascinating to trace. Why did you think that? Where did that thought come from? Very often you can trace that thought pattern to teachers who've inspired you, either in words or in books. Why, did you, why do you think like that? Is it really your thought? Or is it the thought of Ajahn Brahm? Or maybe the thought of Ajahn Sumaita? Or is it the thought of Ajahn Mahabua? Or is it the thought of Calvin and Hobbes? Or whatever, where, is it? where did that thought come from? If you can trace it, it shows you that this thing we call thought does not belong to me. It comes according to its conditions. Thoughts are triggered in the mind because of causes. It's fascinating to see that and to see that deeply. That thought is anatta, not me, not mine, not a self. You cherish thinking because you take it to be me and mine the self. That's why if thinking makes you feel, say, guilty or upset, why does that stay a long time in your mind? Why is it a problem for you? 
Can you take it? It's my thoughts. That's why at the beginning of this range retreat, I encourage people to practice with the mantra, not mine, not mine, not mine. If you could do that with thinking, not mine, not mine, not mine, then the thoughts which come from causes will just disappear very quickly. You will not <coughs> cherish them. They'll just come like the, the wind, just passing by. You won't be able to catch them. Because you won't catch them, you'll never be burdened by them. They'll never be heavy in your mind. Because they never linger like the wind, they just go right past you. So all those thoughts which come up in your mind, even the thoughts which are happening now, isn't it marvellous to have freedom from those thoughts? Why is it that thoughts obsess the mind? Because we think they are mine. We grab hold of them. It's called grasping, it's called clinging. They come in and we grab hold of them and we make them stay because of the illusion that they are important, they're mine, there's something to do with me. They're my thoughts. Some people sometimes have such nice thoughts, they come and tell me during the interview time, they call them insights. They're just thoughts, that's all. Just things come and they go. So let those thoughts alone. Don't take them to be mine. If you take them to be mine, then you go and take your thoughts and beat someone else over the head with them. Argue who's right and who's wrong. They're just thoughts, that's all. Coming from conditions, they just arise in the mind, and then they go away again. Letting them go is far more peaceful, far more joyful. Because thinking is one of the biggest obstacles to meditation success, because it's one of the biggest obstacles to seeing the truth, you do very well for yourself and your happiness and your progress on the path to really remember that thinking is not mine, nothing to do with me. Give it no value, give it no interest and give value and interest much more to the silence. For those of you who have experienced long periods in meditation where not a thought has been going on in your mind, isn't that nice? Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that just so lovely? Just when there's peace there in the mind, not a thought coming up. Remember that. Cherish that thought of no thought. And then it's a thought which ends thought. And it gives you the space. When you're thinking, it's like an inner speech, it's like talking back to the world. When you're talking back to the world, the world cannot teach you. In the same way that whoever sits on top of this chair here giving a Dharma discourse, if you're thinking and fantasizing and talking to yourself while the teacher is giving the sermon or the, the, the talk, there's no way that you can hear what's being said. All truth, all insight, all wisdom arises in the silence. It doesn't come from thought. You have to listen, you have to be silent, you have to be empty and open to see the truth. So. Thought is not me, not mine. Don't take it to be yours and the self. When the thinking stops, still there is movement in the mind. This is the, the doer again. This doer we call will. The reason why it's hard to get into jhanas for some people is because they take will, doer, to be them. Here we're getting to the heart of the illusion of self. You've heard me say before, the citadel of the self, the self-illusion, is the home of the doer and the knower. That's so often what we take to be me, mine, the self. 
first of all, this doer. How much doing have you experienced in your life so far? What a pain it is. What a struggle it is. It's hard to do things. As if you're striving to achieve, to get, to maintain, to hold, to get, to do. Whatever it is, this doing is intrinsically suffering. It's not doing, just laying back, not doing anything. It's called in the West like being on holiday. But it's so hard for people to let go. Why is it hard to let go? Because that which we take to be will is seen, is thought of as being a self. Investigate will doing. Why do you act in that way? Sometimes it's not really called acting, it's called reacting. Acting again, repeating. And so often our actions are just habitual. What we take to be willed action is not just free, but just repeating old habits again and again and again. That should show you that what is will is just habit, conditioning. Whatever you choose to do is not coming from a self at the controls, pushing the buttons, putting the levers and giving the orders. Investigate will. Why did you choose to do that? Even if you just scratch your, your face, why did you decide to do that? You just move your hand. Why? Where did that movement come from? What originated it? Even, why did you think that? Why did the mind move? Why did you get angry? Why were you inspired? What generated that? Look at will. Investigate it. The doer. After a while you start to see that you are a creature of habit, a Pavlovian dog, conditioned. It gets to 10.30, you ring the bell, everyone puts their robe on, and you go downstairs. Book shouts out, monks are coming, and everyone gets in line. Pavlovian dogs, conditioned. <laughs> 7 o'clock on a Wednesday, everyone comes to listen to the talk. Conditioning is good, you don't have to say it's bad, but at least no, it's just conditioning, that's all. Why do you meditate? Just conditioning. So when you start to see the causes of things, the will, the will, the will, the will, you should be able to start to at least suspect that this will is not coming from a self deep within you. It's not some sort of soul who's in control of all of this. And just having that, what do you say, that doubt about the controller, that it might not be me. Having that openness will be what will enable you to let go enough to get into jhanas. One of the biggest obstacles is the doer, the controller. Always that you keep on moving because you think you want to control the whole process, you think you're doing it, that you're in charge. If you think you're in charge, if that delusion is there, that will be a hindrance, that will create restlessness, craving for this, that and the other. You'll never be able to get into jhanas. But if you've got enough doubt about this doer, about will, about chaitanya, that it might be just conditioned, then that might be enough to give you the, the courage to let go of doing. The doer cannot let go of doing. That's just again like eating your head again. That's what sometimes we try and do that. We try and do the non-doing. That's more doing. It has to be like a change, a flip in the mind. A bit of wisdom to see that doing has nothing to do with you. 
you let go. When you let go, this whole process just goes so beautifully, so smoothly, so effortlessly. With like you might get into a jhana. Where the doing has gone, has stopped for so long. When you come out again afterwards, you think, this is good. This is beautiful, this is wonderful. You start to see the the illusion of the doer and that when you have that illusion of a doer, that is what blocks you from feeling freedom from the remoka of the jhanas. It stops you from feeling the bliss. It gives you suffering. To do is to suffer. Doing is dukkha. Dukkha is doing. It's the experience which will teach you. All the thinking, all the imagining, all the rationalizing, even all the comparing with the suttas. The suttas are great. They're the most accurate description you will ever find. But even so, it's the experience which will enlighten you. You get to those deep jhanas, you come out afterwards. Notice, reflect, where was will? Where did it go? In those jhanas, just the mind is still. It's blissful, it's brilliant. Just one thing which doesn't move. Why is there stability there? Because there's no doer to disturb it. When it's a doing, it's like a wave on the lake. The stillness is lost. When the stillness is lost, like the surface of a lake, it distorts the image of the moon high in the sky. When the lake is perfectly still, when nothing is happening, when no one is doing anything to disturb the moment, then the reflection is pure, truthful, real. And it's also very beautiful. The jhanas should give you enough data to see once and for all that this we call a doer is nothing to do with us. Completely conditioned. That has profound effects afterwards. It's not full enlightenment, just seeing the doer. There's the other part of the illusion of self, the knower, which comes next. But at least the will is seen to be completely conditioned, nothing to do with me. What that means is no more any guilt or remorse, pride. You realise that whatever I do, if it's good or if it's bad, people like it or don't like it, I've got no choice about this. It just happens, it's my conditioning. So much freedom comes as a result of seeing that will is conditioned. Sometimes that people afterwards ask the question, if the will is not yourself, it's nothing to do with you, why bother? Why even bother get up at four o'clock in the morning and meditate? And the answer is because you've got no choice. Deeper than the doer is the knower. The two actually go together. You can stop the doer for a little while in jhanas, but it comes back again. You can stop the doer for eons by going to the jhana realms after you die. It will come back again. Once it's a knower, it will react to what it knows. It will do. The knower is usually called consciousness or jitta, mind, this is what knows. That knowing is often assumed to be the ultimate self. You know why that happens? Is because very often people can get the perception, the paradigm in their mind of perceiving something in here which can just know and not be touched by what it knows. You just know heat and cold, pleasure and pain. You can know sort of beauty and ugliness, 
but somehow or other just stand back and not be known, not be sort of touched by it. What's actually happening here is that the nature of consciousness is so fast, so quick, it gives the illusion of continuity and also one misses the point that whatever you say see with your eyes or feel with your body, the mind then takes that up as its own object and it knows that it saw, it knows that it felt. It's that knowing that it saw, knowing that it felt, gives the illusion of objectivity. It can even know that it knew. For a long time when I was reading philosophy books about self-reflection or self-knowledge, the fact that not only do I know, that I know that I know, and I know that I know that I know, which was given as a proof of the existence of a self. I looked into that from experience. What actually is going on with this knowing business? And because of the depth of meditation and the precision which that gives to mindfulness, to awareness, the fact that you can see instead of like through ordinary eyes, through like an electron microscope of the way this mind is actually ha working, what you actually see is this procession of events called knowing. And it's a procession, one after the other in time. And I saw very clearly that when I saw something, then a few, not a few moments, just a fraction of a moment afterwards, then I knew that I saw. And a fraction of a moment afterwards, I knew that I knew that I saw. There's no such thing that I know, that I know, that I know, that I know. The truth of the matter is, I know that I knew, that I knew, that I knew. When you add the perspective of time, it gives you the causal sequence of conscious moments. And not seeing that causal sequence can very easily give you the illusion of a continuous me of a knower. It can give you that illusion on two, for two reasons. The second reason, which I have just been talking about, is the illusion of objectivity. The illusion that you can somehow recede deep inside of yourself to a jitter, to a mind, which can see, which can hear, which can feel, which can touch, which can taste, we can even know, but it's knowing objectively and is not touched. The point is, to know is to be touched, is to be affected. Just like in <laughs> quantum theory, it just comes to mind. As soon as you know something, you've interfered with it. There's no such thing as bare knowledge without interfering. It's actually basic quantum theory, quantum science. It's not just theory, it is truth. To know is to interfere. You're touched by that knowing. So often that's the reason why we think that somehow we can find a knowing where suffering doesn't reach. You can get to a knowing where suffering doesn't appear to reach you for a long time. That's in the jhanas. That's the purest form of knowing you can experience. There's no suffering apparent during those experiences. It's bliss unchanging for long periods of time. If anything is a pure knowing, then that is it. The deeper the jhanas, the purer the knowing appears. It's afterwards coming out when you reflect and that's when you get the perspective. Remember on those mind states which is jitter as pure as it can ever get in those jhanas 
experience those things, then you understand what this jitter really is. You understand what radiant jitter means. You understand a jitter which is absolutely still, which doesn't move, but which still knows very clearly. And knowing again which doesn't move, which doesn't change for long periods of time. Then afterwards it changes, it moves. On afterwards, as it says in such suttas as the Mahamalunkya Puta Sutta, you can see that that even knowing is conditioned, sankhata. That's actually what it says in those suttas. You can see that this too rises because of a cause and ceases when those causes cease. There has to be something more than this pure refined jitta. This is actually where you start to see that even this knowing is not really objective. You cannot separate the knower from the known. As the Buddha kept on saying, in all of the six senses, such as the mind base, when mind base and mind objects come together, turns on mind consciousness, coming together of the three is called pasa. This is conditioned, it has its causes, it's not always going to be there. It comes together. And so you start to see that that which you thought was objective is not objective at all, it's just a way of seeing which is delusional. And you'll never be able to escape suffering that way. The jhanas won't last. The experience will disappear. If you think you're the knower, there'll always be a reaction, an attachment to those jhanas. Secondly, it's not just objectivity, objectivity, thinking that you are somehow removed from what you can know. Secondly, that the experience of pure mind consciousness, knowing what mind truly is, not through theory, not through the books, not through argument and through thinking, but through pure experience, hour after hour, many, many times, of being in jhanas. They, you know the description of jhanas? They're all karmas, wiwichewa karmas separated from the five sense realm. You should know, know even rationally that that means that all five senses have disappeared. All that's left is mind, mind base, mind experience. When you know that mind, you get to know it very well. You understand just why there's an illusion of continuity of knowing. That illusion of continuity of knowing is explained in my fruit salad simile. Once you know what con mind consciousness is, mind activity, the mind sense, then you can actually notice outside of jhanas, in ordinary worldly consciousness, whatever you see is followed immediately by a different type of consciousness, mind consciousness. When that mind consciousness subsides, Maybe it's another sight consciousness, and then mind consciousness. Maybe feeling consciousness, and then mind consciousness. This mind consciousness follows immediately, so close behind the other five senses. But it gives these five senses an illusion of similarity. When you see something, when you hear something, when you feel something with the body, what is in common with those experiences? What gives it the illusion of sameness? After experiencing jhanas, you'll know it's the mind consciousness following always behind, holding the hand, as I say, of the five other senses. Once you see that, then you understand why there's an illusion of continuity with the conscious experience. There's an illusion of a knower persisting through every sensory experience. 
the knower which is there when you wake up in the morning arises and passes away it's granular, fragmentary eventually that that wisdom will allow you to deepen the jhanas the reason why that people don't deepen the jhanas is because of attachment to knowing the knowing stops them from letting go further the four rupa jhanas, the four arupa jhanas the whole purpose of those things is to learn <laughs> through practice bit by bit to let go of more and more consciousness it's like slicing away at mind consciousness allowing it to cease calming it, settling it, allowing it to go to cessation until the consciousness completely ceases for long periods of time in what's called Niroda Samapati cessation of all that is felt and all that's perceived Sanya Vedyati Niroda any person who experiences that they say will be an arahat or an anagami afterwards why? because they've seen the end of consciousness they've touched that as an experience no longer any thought or theories or ideas this is not in the realm of thought all your thought is conditioned this is bare experience and this is the cause which gives rise to that result according to the Buddha you see that knowing is not me, not mine, not a self doing is not me, not mine, not a self mind objects, not me, not mine, not a self body, not me, not mine, not a self all that you took to be you is seen as just delusion what was anatta you realise for not just many years you see very clearly that for many lifetimes you've taken that to be a self and the result of that was so much birth and consequent suffering the cause was so much control and doing and striving wriggling through samsara wriggling towards happiness, wriggling away from pain always trying to control the world your world or your part of the world or your little insy bitsy bit of the world wherever you take yourself to lie and that had caused just so much suffering the desire to be had created so much birth again and again and again now you've seen it's not what you want to see not what you like to see but what actually is you've seen it through the experience of the deep meditations the abandoning of the hindrances the surmounting of conditioning you've gone beyond all of that so it's not what you've been taught it's what you've seen what you've experienced then you understand the brilliance of the Buddha's teaching of anatta it goes right to the heart of everything they say the Dhamma is the source not going to its consequences, not papancha but going right into the very middle the very essence, the very heart the atta, what you take to be you from the body into the mind thinking from the mind into the doer from the doer into the knower if you can see you're not the knower if you can see you're not the doer that the doer is just cause, causal condition knowing is just causal condition so all it is, just process then you'll understand why the Buddha said he now doesn't teach annihilation annihilation means that there's something which existed which is now destroyed nor does he teach eternalism there's something which is never destroyed he teaches the middle way dependent origination 
the process, what you've taken to be a self. Thank you. Do we hand up, Young? <laughs>